Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Marcia Eli from the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History and the Library's Arts and Culture Team, BPL Presents. Um, I want to say at the top that we're having a few technical difficulties, so I hope you'll bear with us. Um, technology, technology, technology. But, um, but we have a great program for you tonight. We have the privilege of hosting a conversation with Bruce Jackson about his new book, Never Far From Home, My Journey from Brooklyn to Hip Hop, Microsoft and the Law. Bruce Jackson is the Associate General Counsel and Managing Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Office of the President of Microsoft. His book tells of his journey from childhood poverty in Brooklyn to top careers in music and tech industries. It's about perseverance, grit, confronting racism. It touches upon entrenched economic inequality, racism in policing and in the halls of corporate America, but it also demonstrates the role of self-empowerment mentors and determination to rise above the challenges. I am honored that our moderator tonight is journalist and professor, uh, born and bred Brooklynite, Ron Howell. During the course of his distinguished career, Ron has written thousands of articles for Newsday, Ebony, the Associated Press, New York Daily News, to name a few. His books include Boss of Black Brooklyn, The Life and Times of Bertram L. Baker, and I'm very excited for this conversation, but before I hand it over to Bruce and Ron, I have a few quick notes for you. First, we are putting a link in the chat to the local community bookstore so that you can explore these books on your own and if you so desire, purchase a copy from an independent business. Second, you have the option for closed captioning tonight. That button is at the bottom of your screen. And finally, I hope that you will share your questions for Bruce this evening. Type them throughout the program into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will take as many as possible. Ron will take as many as possible at, towards the end of the conversation. And with that, it is my enormous honor to welcome our guest tonight. Thank you so much for being here. I hand it over to you. Well, I... Um... Uh, thank you very much. It's an uh, honor to be here. So happy uh, to be uh, doing this with you, uh, uh, Bruce. And uh, first, I wanted to uh, thank the Center for uh, Brooklyn uh, History. Uh, I'm a lover of Brooklyn history, Black Brooklyn history, to be precise. And I appreciate the ways the Center has transformed uh, in recent years. Uh, it's taken on a new identity and is now part of the Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, and it's, by the way, facing uh, budget cuts of millions of dollars, as I've uh, read recently. Th so thank you, uh, Marsha Eli and the Center, for paying tribute today to Bruce Jackson, a striving son of Black Brooklyn who's faced challenges in life that would have put others in a dustbin. Um, so let me just say the reason I was uh, asked to be here and interview Bruce is uh, my published record with regard to Black Brooklyn. I wrote a, a book, 2018, titled uh, Boss of Black Brooklyn, uh, The Life and Times of Bertram L. Baker. Uh, Baker in 1948 became the first Black elected uh, 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 official in Brooklyn. And the book is part memoir because he was my maternal grandfather. But Bruce Jackson's page turner of a book, uh, Never Far From Home, is a full memoir a soul opening memoir full of personal stories that can mesmerize you, even as they often make you angry, sad, or afraid. And of course the title is gripping, uh, Never Far From Home, From Brooklyn to Hip Hop, Microsoft, and the Law. Bruce, tell us what was your motive in writing this book? First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for having me on this uh, webcast. Um, the, the interesting thing is, um, Ron, I was approached by entertainment clients of mine. I was an entertainment attorney 
before joining Microsoft. And my former clients approached me and stated that, Bruce, they thought, it, they think it'd be a great idea for you to write a book and to tell your story because many people in our community in urban America, they want to be what they see. And what they see is athletes being successful or entertainers being successful. They don't really see much more because we typically, when we do break through, don't go back. And so their idea was, since I came from the inner city, poor, poverty-stricken area, like themselves, it would be great for me to tell a story so people can see another option of actually getting out. So that was kind of the basis of it. Um, but as I wrote it, it's, it's much bigger than that, right? It's about inspiring those who are underserved, but it's also about inspiring immigrants who have barriers and obstacles. It's about women who have it, LGBTQ plus community who have it as well. And people, to be quite honest with you, a lot of people have approached me from rural America and said, hey, I understand. I could relate to your story because they too, outside of racism, are dealing with obstacles and barriers they have in order to really be successful in America. And also, I think ultimately, I also want to inspire people like myself who are successful to basically share their story because I think it's one of the most incredible weapons that we all have to really inspire the young people. Um, oftentimes, people in corporate America don't want to share their story because they think that it may impact their career in a negative way. But I think in terms of inspiring young people, I think we all should share our story. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, wonderful. I would like to know, too, how long it took you to uh, uh, do this, to, to do the book. And there's so much uh, involved in it, of course. Uh, there's researching, there's writing, uh, and then the publishing, you know, and, and all of that. Each aspect takes its time. How long did it take? Right. I think that's one of the things a lot of people are asking me, Ron. They're like, I want to write a memoir. How long does the whole process take? I think the process is essentially, you know, you write a proposal and that can take anywhere up to or over more than six months just to put together a proposal. And that's when you shop the proposal, you get an agent and the agent will shop the proposal to major publishers. And then once you decide which publisher you want to go with, and in my case, it was Simon & Schuster. Um, then I think you sign a deal with, in my case, Simon and Schuster, and they give you another seven months to complete it. And you complete it within a seven month and they put you kind of on holding pattern for at least a year from the point you actually submitted to them and put you in the cycle. So I submitted a book. It was probably 13, 14 months. Then you placed on hold for a year before they actually release it. Mm -hmm. And that's not bad because you know that some people um, are uh, doing it for many years, uh, not right. to mention searching around for a publisher. Um, but I would imagine you had influential people also on your side, given all the connections you've made and what you're doing there at uh, Microsoft. And uh, and it, it so many people are, are benefiting uh, from this. Uh, well, we uh, of course uh, refer to black. Brooklyn, and I'm a bit older, uh, uh, I'll acknowledge, <laughs> than you are, <laughs> but your Black Brooklyn 2 is, say, the mid-late 1900s, towards the uh, end of the century, and it was a very, very different world. It was a very, very different world, and uh, as we hinted at, uh, you faced uh, so many challenges. Uh, and I, I, I've known uh, uh, buddies from my neighborhood who went through so much, and and uh, I did too, sometimes because of what they did. But here's something that, that really stands out, you know, in the um, book. You mentioned that you were arrested when you were 10 years old, yeah. 10 years old. I would like you to uh, tell us about that. Of course, it's there in the book. But the emotional impact of that and everything else, tell us about it. Right. I, I think, Ron, I lived in Brooklyn, pre-gentrified Brooklyn, um, Crown Heights to be exact. And at the age of nine, my mother moved and we moved to the public housing projects in Manhattan. And at that point, what she did, she taught all of my 
siblings, including myself, how to travel from Manhattan to Brooklyn by train, because that's where our family and friends live, almost exclusively in Brooklyn. And so I must have made that trip from Manhattan to Brooklyn by myself at 10 over a dozen times. And this one particular time that you're making reference to, I decided to leave Manhattan at about five so I can get to my grandmother's house at six. And she lived in the projects in Crown Heights for dinner. So I thought I'll get to our house by six and we'll have dinner, which is a great thing. I got on the train and, and as soon as I got to, got off the express train at Utica Avenue to take the local train to Ralph Avenue, which was a stop, I noticed that a white cop and a Caucasian man were talking and he said, there he is. But living in New York, you hear noise all the time, so you just don't pay any attention. And I heard it again saying, there he is. What are you waiting for? And I looked, the officer and my eyes locked. And then he started to proceed in my direction. And there was nowhere for me to go but to run and to the front of the train, jump on the track, stepped over the third rail. And, you know, then you get on the ledge and you just run underground from one station to the other, which is what I did. And however, by the time I got to the other station, there were four cops waiting for me. And at that point, um, and certainly running through the train station is terrifying because, you know, you got trains going back and forth. You have rodents. But I was just more afraid of the police officer at that time than those conditions. And by the time I got to the other end, four cops arrested me. I said, what do I do? They didn't say anything until they took me to the 77th precinct on Utica Avenue. And at that point, they said, you robs a man. And witnesses stated that you rob him. And they handcuffed me to run the old fashioned wooden chairs. And they said, uh, just say you did it and you get to go home. And at 10 years old, certainly alone, but scared, I said, I didn't do it. And they said, we have witnesses. But if you say you did it, it'd be a lot easier on you and you get to go home. And I maintained my innocence, to be quite honest with you. And then about three hours later, my mother and my uncle came to pick me up from the precinct. And one of the things I recall, but I never really mentioned it to my parents or my uncle or my mother till today, um, when we walked out, the cops were like, dumb niggers. And I looked at my mother, looked at my uncle, and I guess in my mind, they probably said, Bruce, this is the late 70s. This is not a place where you have that discussion. So they just walked out and never said anything. And it wasn't until two weeks later, my mother called the precinct and they said, we found the person who did it. And so there was no apology, no excuse for disrupting a 10 year old life. Um, and the reason I kind of told that story, Ron, is because that still happens today. Uh, and I came very close to admitting that I did it because I wanted to go home. And the reason I wrote it in the book, because if you recall, the Central Park Five is a prime example of five young men who are accused of sexually molesting a woman in Central Park and everyone, including our former president, Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani was calling them animals. Um, and they admitted to the crime because they wanted to go home. And we subsequently realized they didn't commit the crime at all. And so the reason I wrote it is because we all are quick to rest the judgment when a black kid, 10, 11, 12, run from the police officer or older. And sometimes you run because you're just scared. Yes. And I want to sensitize people to that. And sometimes yes. when you say that you commit a crime, sometimes you just want to go home. And that was what yes. I was confronted with. And yes. so that's what I want people to be sensitized. Let's not be quick to run and judge someone because they ran from the police or they committed, stated that they commit a crime that they didn't commit. Yes. And so that's the reason, because had I commit, had I basically confessed to that, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Mm -hmm. My life would have been totally different. I would have been on a totally different track. But for some reason, this skinny 10 year old boy did not succumb to the pressure. Well, you, you had a lot of grit and uh, clearly stand out in, in that regard. And uh, reflecting on it myself, I just don't know uh, how I would have uh, reacted to it. Um, you know, um, but you had something in there, uh, in yourself, in your spirit, that uh, showed was uh, an early sign that you would be able to go as far as you did 
in life. Uh, so, so impressive. And regarding the Central Park uh, Five, by the way, one of them, of course, out of jail, but is now running for city council. Isn't that something? Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and that that's a triumph too. Uh, and, you know, you can say that's what life is about, you know, standing up and 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 just making the best of the circumstances you you find yourself in at a at a given uh, moment. Oh, um, well, you're gonna find a way to make make the system work for everyone, and that people wouldn't necessarily have to go through that. That's a yes, nice yes. scenario. Yes. Um, as, on this uh, uh, topic again, because it's so meaningful, as you say, people are still going through it. But looking back to the 19th. 70s, specifically 1978, you were 15 years old and you personally witnessed a police killing mm -hmm. that was very much like the George Floyd episode. Right. It was essentially the George Floyd episode of its day. You know, Absolutely. 2020, of course, we know what happened with George Floyd. Um, and it was a murder with blue impunity, except that there was eventually an arrest with um, uh, George uh, Floyd. Um, but this was the murder of Arthur Miller, right? Become a legend, a legend in Black Brooklyn. Yep. Al Sharpton, especially um, Reverend Herbert Daughtry, and so many were out there on the streets protesting yep. it. But the guy was uh, killed. He was killed that day, and he was a businessman, not not some you know uh, a, a drug addict or anything. And you witnessed it and had a connection to him. You were 15 Absolutely. years old. Please tell us about that. Yeah, I think Arthur Miller lived on, well, he was a super of one of the buildings where I lived in Brooklyn on Prospect Avenue and Crown Heights. And what he would do is just so you put money in the kid's pocket, he would just go have us clean up the back of the building and bring trash to the front, just to put money in our pocket. So he was that type of guy. He was viewed as a civil rights leader for the community or activist. And so by the time I got to this particular situation, again, in Crown Heights, the what I saw, I came at the tail end. I just saw him at the ground with a nightstick at his neck and his body was motionless at that time. And you hear different views of what happened. Of course, the police view was substantially different for those who were there from the very beginning. And you're right. There was no conviction the police officer and partly because we didn't have cameras in the early 70s or the late 70s to really substantiate what was going on so yeah you saw that and so when I saw George Floyd people said why are you not really responding I said because I've seen this play out before uh, in in many cases right once I saw his lifeless body but prior even after that I've heard about people being abused by the police officer and being held in chokehold and some dying, but nothing really stuck into George Floyd's situation. So I wasn't surprised. That sort of activity went on practically all my life, right? Yes, yes. You know, and there have been advances, not just in technology and uh, being able to use cameras to take uh, videos of situations like that, but there's been progress um, in other respects, the kind that Martin Luther King was fighting for right here in Brooklyn, in New York City, in Brooklyn. For instance, um, Ken Thompson, um, just several years ago, became the first uh, Black person yeah. to be a district attorney. I feel comfortable saying that that would not have happened. And forget about the videos if Ken Thompson were around. Uh, it was just, you know, his personality. So to some extent, there's been... Um, you know, some progress in that uh, regard. Now we have, oh, of course, he died very young, but now we have Eric uh, Gonzalez, who still, we have to say, is very, very uh, progressive. So in some respects, there, there are different times. Um, before um, shifting, uh, moving on, I should just point out very clearly that the Center for Brooklyn History has been uh, paying tributes to Arthur Miller uh, in past years, especially on the anniversaries of his um, of his killing. And the 45th is coming up this June. Um, so in about two months. And my understanding is, is that they're working on a uh, on a memorial, a gathering and, uh, you know, trying to determine who would be invited as uh, uh, main speakers. But I expect that it will be 
uh, a time to learn from history and to grow uh, from it, to grow from it. So uh, we thank the uh, the center for that uh, too. Uh, what what an amazing uh, uh, story. Um, let me uh, move and 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 shift a bit. Bit talk talking about this black Brooklyn in those days. And of course, uh, much of the same, of course, people were experiencing, especially blacks, right. and then black uh, males uh, in Manhattan uh, as well, of course. Uh, regarding Brooklyn, in central uh, Brooklyn, uh, there, you had a friend who left Brooklyn to be part of the ABC program, it stands right. for a better chance. And it sends inner city kids to private schools. Right. Um, often, if not most of the time in New England. Now, you knew a young man and he you wound up being very, very close to him. Tell us about that young man and your relationship with him. I, I, it happens. Well, I know it happened in Brooklyn. Friend of mine, actually. Crown Heights was sent to a school, not the New England school, was sent to a school outside of his district. But particularly the person you're talking about is law, my law school best friend. He essentially grew up in the Bronx and a and the projects in the Bronx. And what he did, well, what his mother did was made him apply to a better chance program. And he got admitted to a school in New England. And he didn't want to go. He wanted to go to school with his friends, a local school. But his mother said, I think this would be a great opportunity for you and, and you're going. So he went. And after graduating from high school in New England, he went to Georgetown University. And then he went to Georgetown Law School. So at the age he left his parents, he was 13 years old. And when he and I talked about it, he said, Bruce, it was not a great decision because he said, it's unfortunate that at 13, I had to leave my family and friends behind. And he said, I, that was the most nurturing time in my kid's development. And he said, I never really had the relationship with my mother or my siblings that the normal kid would have because I spent most of my time in New England. And right after New England, I went to DC. So I really never came back home except on occasional holidays because he didn't have money to come back on all holidays to visit my family. So he doesn't think it's a great program that you have to send a kid away from his family, friends, and his community to go to school, as opposed to building a good school in the community in which you live. So, so no, he would say it's not a good thing, and he wouldn't recommend it. Mm -hmm. Although it did end up paying out, panning out for him in a very successful way. And there are many people, um, some of whom I know, who did benefit from it in the long run. And um, you would concede that you're yourself, despite the uh, the prices that you, um, hey, that you pay being uh, yeah. pulled from, um, you know, essentially the people that you um, love. Um, but here in New York in those days, there were programs, and I guess maybe you'd call it the beginning of uh, uh, the uh, racial uh, progressive uh, era in, uh, in New York and around New York, uh, there were programs that were helping youngsters of color like you. Yep, absolutely. Get a foot in the door. And one of them was uh, NOAA, which uh, stands for New Opportunities at Hofstra. There were so many just interesting experiences you had there. Which ones stand out and you would like to, to share with us now? I, I think the, the initial experience, I think what I did, Howard, is... I made a decision at 13 myself to participate in the high school that I went to co-op program. And that was working one week, going to school one week. It was a great decision from a perspective to keep me off the streets from doing anything illegal to make money, i.e. selling drugs. But it was a poor academic decision because I'm going to school essentially part-time, working one week, going to school one week. And I'm attending a school that's not very good academically to begin with. So poor decision academically. And so to get into college, I had to apply to the Higher Education Opportunity Program, which Hofstra was one of them. The NOAA program was one located in Hofstra. You're absolutely right that these programs at many different universities 
across the country at that point. What I had to do was complete a summer program to get into Hofstra. Mm -hmm. And after about two weeks, I realized that I was not academically prepared for college. Yeah. And I called my mother and I said, mom, I can't do this. This is hard. And my mother, being a mother, didn't want to see me in pain, said, if you want to come home, come home. And then I had to make a second call, which was to my aunt. And she said, I already know, Bruce, you want to come home. I heard. But what do you want to do? Go back to the projects? I said, maybe. She said, do you want to go back and work for Chase Manhattan in, in the basement making copies, which was my job when I was in co-op? I said, maybe. And I guess she thought I was, she wasn't getting anywhere <laughs> with trying to rap. <laughs> yeah. And so she then said, well, listen, you're not coming home because your grandmother picked cotton, couldn't look white folks in the face, took care of white folks' houses her entire life, and had to say, yes, ma'am, yes, no, ma'am, no, sir. She said, did your mother pick cotton as well, Bruce? She said, so did I. And no one in the Jackson family ever graduated. Not your generation, no one. So she said, you're not coming home. And she hung up the phone. And at that point, what I realized was, first of all, I'm glad that I listened to her and I kind of took her advice. So you got to be willing to listen and take advice. But I realized the most important thing I realized is that this journey that I'm on is not really about me. And it's okay if your purpose is something other than you. And that was my core, right? Throughout my life, because many times during the course of my life, I wanted to give up. But I recall that conversation and realized that I was doing it for my aunt, my mother, and my grandmother, all the suffering that they went through. And the purpose of trying to create an opportunity for the next generations of Jacksons to follow. And so that was my strength, right? And that's why I couldn't give up. So that's why I didn't leave Hofstra at that point, because I listened. And there were other points in the journey of Bruce Jackson's life where I wanted to give up. But I just recall that conversation mm -hmm. and said, I'm not doing this for me. Had I decided that I was doing this journey just for me, I probably would have given up mm -hmm. at different points. But I realized this was not a journey for Bruce Jackson. I was doing it for other people, which was fine for me, right? Particularly if I'm going to inspire the next generations of Jacksons to push forward. And you want to know what the reality is? Several members of the Jackson family graduated from college. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it worked out. So I respect my aunt for that. Congratulations. You know, there's, there's something else that uh, comes to mind in, in, in this uh, context, because, uh, yes, w those feelings that uh, came to the fore and you have family members to to thank uh, for that. Um, uh, but also you were struggling at the time, you know, so uh, you said, yes, I'm going to do it and do it for you as well as me. But there was the issue of money, um, you know, and just trying to make enough to you know, uh, buy the things you felt you need while you were um, a student. Mm -hmm. There's something that came up in my recollection of your um, experiences there when you were doing uh, tutoring. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a technicality. But you know what technicalities can do? I mean, people, as we know, uh, get arrested on technicalities, right? As Absolutely. you uh, Absolutely. have in the past. And there's one that really stood out for me. Can you... Um, Right. I mean, so so what it is, is that certainly my family tried to support me by giving me food stamps and whatever they could based on the monthly stipends they were getting from the government. So they contribute, but it certainly wasn't enough. So what happened was the university ultimately, so I struggled, but how I end up really progressing at Hofstra is two quotes, right? One was Frederick Douglass, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. I used that and said, Bruce is going to be painful, but work hard and you'll get it. Then there's a Longfellow poem that talks about the height reach and kept by great men were not achieved overnight or by sudden flight, but they 
while their companion slept what tolling up was doing the night, which essentially means you just outwork somebody. So that was my mission. It's going to hurt because you don't you didn't start it out with the resources that your other colleagues did. However, you can outwork them over time and catch them. And that's what I did. So ultimately, the university approached me and said I was an accounting major and said, do you want to tutor the university students in accounting? So now just take a step back. Just a few years ago, I was this kid from the ghetto who was ready to quit. Now the university is asking me to tutor those individuals who were privileged in accounting, uh, this black guy from the inner city. So I did that. And the process was, is once they set a schedule with me, I'll tutor them, I'll submit the timesheet, and I'll get compensated. So what, what was happening often is that they would set the schedule and not show up. So that would disrupt my entire day or schedule. And so what I would do is go to them and say, you need to sign this timesheet. And ultimately, it escalated to the provost that Bruce is essentially stealing money because you having people sign and you didn't perform the services. But I didn't think of it that way. I said, they're wasting my time and I want to get compensated. And so ultimately, it went up to the provost. And that's when I realized privilege. And you may say, well, what do you mean, Bruce? I was probably the top accounting student and one of the top top of black accounting student, one of the top accounting students. So the provost didn't want to kick me out. So he kind of took it to the dean of the program who threatened to kick me out for a period of two months. And ultimately, the students, faculty all said, don't kick Bruce out. And, and that's the reason I didn't get kicked out of Hofstra at that point. At that point, we're talking about my senior year. Um, so again, I wouldn't have been here had it not been for people coming to my aid and rescue and supporting me on that initiative and knowing that I didn't do it intentionally. I did it just out of the whole perspective that I set up time and people didn't show up. And I thought I should have been compensated for that. But ultimately, I acknowledge I was wrong. I should not have done it that way. And what I learned from that is never to put yourself in a position where someone else has control over your career life because it was a two month period where I just had to set back and wait and see what they were gonna to do to me. So from that point on, I said, I'll never let anyone control me that much ever again in life. Never put yourself in a position where someone has that much control over you. So that was a mistake, it was a learning. Had they decided to kick me out again, like I said, I wouldn't be here today with you. Yes, yes. That was um, really, really something. Um, and, uh, because I identified with you, it, 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 in some respects, it seemed like the right thing, or at least uh, theoretically, because you know you had this arrangement where you're supposed to be tutoring the people, and you are, are there showing up. It seems you you would get paid for that. But these uh, kids just decide not to come. You know, it seemed like an injustice. But um, but you learned from the experience, uh, whether Absolutely. it was right or wrong. That that was the law, as it were, at the time. And your, your reference to, by the way, accounting, I think that stands out uh, for um, uh, Black uh, people. You know, you talk about, um, you know, math in, uh, in college. And, uh, you know, I think there's so, much, so few uh, Black folks who go into it. Um, I would add my grandfather was an accountant and... Uh, um, it did him well and did uh, <laughs> me well. But um, were you always a numbers kind of guy? I mean, you were very slick. And there are some ways in, you know, that you show yourself to be a hustler, I would say. People have to read the book to see that. The way right. you were, you know, just getting, grabbing newspapers before they were delivered to uh, stores and then selling them and making a, a lot of money. But what made you to decide to blend law with accounting? Um, and I'll add one last thing because I think it's kind of funny. Uh, how did Perry Mason figure into the law <laughs> school uh, choice? And you'd have to tell them about the Perry Mason uh, movies, of course. But law school and accounting, Perry Mason, go ahead, however you want to. Well, 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 I think let's start out. Why, why the law? The law was Perry Mason. It was a 
lawyer on television. I saw him perform and I said, that's what I want to do. Now, it probably was a bit unrealistic for a kid in the ghetto wanting to be Perry Mason, but that's my first image of a lawyer. And I certainly wanted to pursue that. But that subsequently changed as I saw the injustice that took place in our community. I said, you know what? I want to be a criminal lawyer and represent people who look like me. But that never came to being. So I think accounting, I just uh, was passionate about. It. In fact, I'm at a conference now with the African-American Mayors Association, with all the mayors in the cities, African-American mayors in the cities in the U.S. And I was just talking to someone about accounting. I said, he said he was an accounting major. I said, not many people, African-Americans majored in accounting. So it was to the extent that the actual professors I had, if I got an A in a class, I oftentimes was pulled over, pulled to the side. And they would ask me, did you take this class before? Because their philosophy was, it's impossible for you to get an A in this class as an African-American unless you took the class before and you're repeating it. And that's, that explains why you're getting an A. Um, but what I did, I just did the work, right? I just understood the concepts and the principles. I just grasped that pretty quickly. And I put in the work, really, right? I did all the problems that were necessary to do in the back of the book. I didn't cheat myself. And so I knew it, every sort of version of an exam he can poss they can possibly present, because I knew it. Um, so, so that's how I got that. So I had a passion and interest to be an accountant at that point. But the interesting thing is I got a job, I interviewed with all the big eights. Now I'm aging myself, the big eight accounting firms. Now there's the big four, that's what they call them. So I got offers from almost all of them. So I decided to go with Arthur Anderson. And at that point, the recruiter said, well, we want you at Arthur Anderson, here's the package, um, but what do you really wanna do? I said, I wanna go to law school. She said, don't accept this offer. So I looked at her and I was like, I'm a poor kid from the ghetto and working for Arthur Anderson, making the type of money you have on the table can certainly serve me and my mother well. But ultimately, I, again, I took her advice. And she said, I'm going to make a call. And you probably should have an interview with someone at Georgetown. And I did. And once they did, conducted the interview, I got in, certainly off my grades, not really the, the interview, but that certainly helped. Um, and that's how I pursued the accounting law. But then I ultimately started focusing on tax law, which, again, is rare for African-Americans, right? Right. And I pursued a career in tax law and I was a tax attorney once I got out of law school. So I wasn't Perry Mason or the the attorney that was performing criminal law representing people who look like me. I was a tax attorney representing corporations. So it was a totally different uh, avenue I took because I think I followed my true passion at that point. What a journey. <laughs> you know, I had this in mind uh, from the very beginning, you know, reading your title and saying it is an absolute uh, journey. And uh, each step along the way, it's just so clear how special, you know, I'm tempted to say unique. I I, I don't think I know anyone else who fits your, um, you know, specific uh, patterns in life. And you should be, uh, I hope, very proud that I uh, that I say that. Um, but that being said, there are occasions in the in the book, you know, when as a high school student and a college student, and, and also in the professional world, when white people, and you made a quick reference to this, but um, you uh, talk about in, in more detail, occasions when they would express suspicions that you could just not make it in their world. And it could be crushing to some people, you know, uh, 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 so hurtful to your uh, ego and maybe would uh, really disrupt the ambitions of, of some. But tell us about a couple of those. What was said and who were the people? Is someone at a top law firm? Uh, um, right. I, I think it happened, along. Right. it happened all throughout my journey. I think in high school, I was told, I, I got held over in the fourth grade. Uh, in high school, I was told that I was in college material. In college, I was constantly told, well, how can you do this? Are you repeating this course for the second time? Uh, in the summer program I went before I went to law school, a professor said, I don't think you're cut out for this. <laughs> um, I can tell you the law firm, after taking 
several tax courses, um, I got an internship at a tax law firm. And we went to lunch one time. This is the incident you're talking about. So the second year of law school, typically you get a job in the summer. And then after that job, they typically extend an offer for you for a job full time. So I got a job in the summer, a tax firm. We went to lunch at a, an exclusive club in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. I was the first African-American they ever hired. I, I would say that I don't know if I would ever want to do that again in life, be the first. Um, however, I was the first. And the people went to lunch with the other summer associates, including myself. There were other partners, Caucasian partners who went, and the name partner of the firm went. And the name partner was talking to another associate, a Caucasian white woman. And he turned to me for some reason and said, Bruce, you may know something about the ghetto. Can you explain it? Can you tell us about it? And, and I'm not sure if it was, when I reflect upon it, I'm not sure if it was an intentional, I think it was unconscious bias is what we would call it today. Because he, he thought that I was really going to explain it to him. And everyone at the table were waiting for me to explain it. <laughs> so I said to myself, I said, well, and which is what I always do, Ron, I typically pause before I say something. And I paused and I said, well, I'm not going to have this job for long. Um, so I got myself together and I said, well, mister, and I mentioned his name and you read the book and you'll hear his name. I said, I don't know anything about the ghetto. And now mind you, Ron, I could have written a thesis about the ghetto. I said, I don't know anything about the ghetto, sir. I said, perhaps you do. And perhaps you don't mind sharing with everyone at this table what you know. So at that point, initially, everyone was waiting for me to explain what the ghetto was and life like with the ghetto. And then once I said that response to him, everyone's face dropped. And within two minutes, we all were leaving the restaurant. And by the time I got back, everyone at the firm who didn't attend the lunch apologized. And the interesting thing is, at the end of the summer, they made an offer to me to join the firm. Mm -hmm. And my best friend was like, Bruce, I know there's no way you're going to join the firm knowing he's a racist. I said, listen, the reality is, is that I'm going to be a tax attorney. There are very few of us African-American tax attorneys at that point in the 80s. So I'm going to have to deal with this anyway. This is America, after all. At least I know what I'm dealing with. And so I accepted the offer. And he and I did a little tap dance for two years until we got sick of each other. And then I said, OK, it's time to leave. I think I proved my point that the next African-American that comes through here wouldn't necessarily have to go through what I went through. <laughs> I like that tap dance. <laughs> because I guess to an extent, uh, as some of life is about being on a, a stage and and uh, taking on the role Absolutely. of uh, actor yeah yep. uh and and you did it well in each uh instance i must say i guess i'd have to make sure i uh, bounce um along here what is it <laughs> yeah because um we want to get to uh the questions that uh, would be in the chat but there are a couple of important uh things uh being um an associate general counsel for Microsoft uh, is extraordinary, um, you know, and uh, for so many years we've been hearing in college and high school uh, how uh, teachers are trying hard to get uh, students, especially of color, especially Black and Latino, uh, interested in um, technology, uh, but the technology sector of our economy has been pitifully lacking in right. uh, representation of Blacks and, and Latinos, uh, especially. And there you are at Microsoft. You're like at the uh, at the pinnacle. You know, there might be some others uh, competing uh, uh, companies who would argue with you. Be that as it may, Microsoft we're talking about. Um, and you have been understanding that, the uh, lack of representation. Uh, you have been doing your uh, bit, your share, what you consider to be your duty to try to change things. And, um, and Brad Smith, of course, has been very much 
even aggressively behind you in your career. And, and he's the vice chair, by the way, and the president of Microsoft Corporation. So you talk about uh, having someone with, um, you know, uh, cachet uh, behind you. There it is. Uh, tell us about that, how you've been trying to boost diversity at Microsoft and beyond that in the tech field. Right. Well, let, let me tell you how it started. I think I decided to leave the music industry in 2000 because the digital transformation took place in the music. We hear about digital transformation a lot, right? When we talk about companies today, we state that they should digitally transform or they are in the process of digitally transforming. But in terms of the music industry, it took place in 2000. And you may say, well, what do I mean by that? In two th prior to 2000, we would distribute music via an album, physical distribution. It wasn't until Napster came into place where you can start transferring music digitally. And the business model for the music company was have one single good song on an album and people would buy an album. But that wouldn't work in a digital world. So because people would just download that one song. And so I decided to Microsoft was looking for someone to help it get into the music industry. And I was looking for someone to help me understand the technology. And so my idea was to go there for two years, understand it, come back to the music industry, have a competitive advantage over all the attorneys and the executives, because no one knew technology, that whole technology music space. So I would have been the person, so to speak. But when I look back in two years, the music industry was turned upside down because they didn't embrace the digital transformation movement. So I decided to stay at Microsoft for that reason, but I was going to leave Microsoft for another reason. And the other reason was essentially, I was the third African-American Microsoft hired in the legal department. One left by the time I got there. So it was just myself and a sister from Nigeria. And I decided that I was going to leave. So I approached Brad, he said, why are you leaving? I said, there's a lack of diversity. At 2000, Microsoft wasn't very diverse. I moved out to Seattle, Seattle wasn't very diverse. And I made a decision that is about my happiness, not about the opportunity or money, and I'm going to leave. And he said, "I." the thing he said that was key, he said, I understand. He said, let's see if we can get you back to New York. And he did. He got me back to New York. So I wouldn't be here had he not done that. And he said, from the diversity standpoint, we're going to make this place better. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of gave me a license to help Microsoft on its diversity journey to make it a better and more diverse place. So what I did, I just took advantage of that, right? I took advantage of that license. And when I had the opportunity to really diversify it, particularly my team, when I managed the entire US team, which is a $20 billion business, I Ooh. had 15, 15 women on the team of which seven were African-Americans. I had two Latinos, two Asians, two Caucasian men, and it was me, right? So it was a very diverse team. In fact, I didn't make the decision. I just helped create the culture. One of my leaders were an Af uh, was a male Caucasian from Fargo. And he had four people reporting to him. And guess what, Ron? All four of them were Black. Isn't that something? To have? So no, it's, it's, it's about, it's about yeah. that sort of stuff, right? So we yeah. had that team. So I wanted to send the message internally that you can stack a diverse team against a $20 billion business, which is larger than most Fortune 500 companies, mm -hmm. or externally so people can see it to try to make the movement. So those are the type of things that I did as well as make recommendations when people were coming to well, me to go to other companies so they yeah. can help diversify. Pat yourself on the back and uh, we are doing it too. Uh, we're moving along in time, but there's something I really felt I needed to get to. Um, this has to do with the family, you know, mm -hmm. that I had uh, said to you, suggested, and you agreed that family is the uh, right. is the center, and you have been revealing that in uh, your memoir. Um, I understand regarding your father because he really stands out, you know, and it's mm -hmm. often uh, when you're telling a memoir, it's it's right. you know, Sigmund Freud is in there, you know. Um, and so tell us about him, because he was absent from much, much of your life, but he was such a special part of it. I understand you're willing to read um, a, a poem, as it as it were, um, that he would often recite. And right. uh, did this come up? Because I had uh, had exchanges with Amina. Right, um, right. 
Yeah, uh, Jackie Early's um, well, 1,968 winters. Right. It, 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 could, would you read it? Right. I don't have it in front of me, but I just know it, right? There's a poem okay. that my father wasn't really around, but when he was around, oftentimes he would just walk around the house and say, the poem would go, I woke up this morning feeling good and black, thinking black thoughts, did black things, mind my own black business, play my own black records, put on my own black clothes, walk out my own black door, Lord have mercy, white snow. So he would say that repeatedly. And I just, as a young kid, I didn't know what he was saying. In fact, I said, what, well, he's going crazy or something, right? But as I got older and I spoke to Jackie early, it was just like you can live in the comfort of a black world. But once you leave that black world, hey, it's, it's different. The comfort's not there. Yes, yes. So that's the kind of analogy that he was trying to make. So in his own way, yeah, mm -hmm. he was definitely yeah. trying to teach us things. We didn't you know, always pick up that. on it until much later, right? Because he was pretty yeah. active. And the as black book both as he was yeah though he would say you could do a book on your father my concern now is the time and giving folks who are listening in here the opportunity to share uh uh, uh questions that maybe we ought to um jump uh into that the last thing i wanted to say about that uh poem you know what it brings to mind and i coincidentally happened to be reading through it again the souls of black folk by um w.e.b du bois where he talks yep. about the veil and double consciousness yep. that we live a life uh thinking only of those within our sphere hmm. would be black folks and then there's the world outside and we have to change and think differently and speak yep. Yep. differently yep. and we see it all and he wrote that uh w.e.b du bois in 1903 and things have not changed things have not changed now bruce um what I'd like to do is go into the chat here um, and take a look, because uh, I understand that they were going to be sent to me. This has been very uh, thrilling, I would say. Let me. Uh, there's a one that is anonymous. Let's see. I have uh, read the book. It's great. Which thoughts pull stronger? <laughs> pull strongest brooklyn or manhattan <laughs> you know what I, I would have to say brooklyn because that's where i my roots started but more importantly that's where all my family and friends live right there was no one in my family that lived outside of brooklyn other than us when we moved to manhattan so we're back and forth to brooklyn all the time in fact i spent two years with my grandmother and king brill's king bridge bridge project and Crown Heights when I was in high school. And I spent a significant amount of my time in Brownsville with my my favorite aunt. And yeah. I talked with her in the book. So I spent a lot of time growing up in Brooklyn. Yes. yes. And that's something your reference to Brownsville, by the way, because I, I think we can stay with it for a while. It's very, very meaningful to me. And uh, your identification with uh, Brooklyn, Black Brooklyn, obviously, that that's what gave me this feeling at the beginning, that it was a, um, a suitable fit as it were, for, for me, and I hope for uh, both of us. Um, and our um, feelings about Brownsville, what you experienced there. And let me say that I have a first cousin. Uh, I won't say his full name because uh, it's still, um, you know, done, wreaked so much havoc with his family, but he was murdered on the streets of uh, Brownsville and he grew up in the Brownsville projects. Yep. Uh, and this would have been the late uh, 1980s. Your experiences in Brown that compete with that. Yeah. In Brownsville. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Brownsville, what stands out? Brownsville, Troy, Troy was in Brownsville, right? Troy? It's Brownsville. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, tell us what happened with yeah, Troy. Yeah, Brownsville to me, is, it was and still is probably one of the most challenging public housing complex to live in. I mean, on a, whenever I visit my aunt, almost all the time, someone was getting shot, right? Right. If you look out a window on the basketball court, now they took that basketball court down. Um, no, I think Troy was just someone in the community that we grow up with who was uh, engaged in illegal activity, selling narcotics. There's no question about it. And he was, a, but he was a good friend and a good guy. That was just his way of making money. 
And what happened was whenever we wanted to really go out and feel comfortable about maneuvering around Brownsville, we'd call him up and he would take us around because no one really bothered him. So he was somewhat of a security guard, right? We wanted to go to the store, we'll call Troy. And ultimately, one day we're actually out with him in front of my aunt's building. And one of his friends walked by and said, and Troy looked at him and Troy opened up his coat jacket and Troy revealed that he had a gun and his friend kept walking. Then his friend came back and said, it's getting hot. And then Troy looked at myself and my cousin and said, you guys get out of here. And we, again, it's all about listening, right? I could, we could have said, Troy, you come with us. Uh, no, nah, we're not going anywhere. But we respect him enough. He said, get out. And we started to move, right? To go into my aunt's building. And about 10 seconds before we even got in the building, we hit, heard gunfire. And by the time we got up the steps, she was on the second floor and we looked out her window. Troy and his friend was both laid out in blood. And so they were killed, right? But he was a drug dealer. And that's what we saw. So, and it came, it was very close. It could have been us had we decided to stay, but it wasn't, but it was sad in any event. And it just brought you closer to the fact that, you know, people who sell drugs, right? But when someone real close to you gets killed, you're like, this is real, right? It's, it's a different feeling that you have when it's someone that's close. Knowing people who get killed for drugs is one feeling but someone you really know you're like okay this is something i'm never gonna sell i get involved because this is where it would lead not just jail because you realize going to jail is certainly an option and although sometimes people in our community use it as a badge of honor i knew early on of the crime that took place in jail whether it's sexual abuse or just abuse period right so it's something I wanted to stay away from, which is why I decided never to sell drugs or rob anyone. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Good for you. I said I made the bad decision to go in the co-op program, right? Mm -hmm. you no, know, but your decision academically have been very good, and we're all benefiting from it here. Right. Here, um, yeah. Given all that you've done, been through the successes you've had against so many uh, odds, would you think of veering off into politics now. You're with some politicians, uh, Black elected officials right now? We're, we're, Absolutely. Yeah, uh -huh. is, is there someone famous from New York City who's there? He will be here tomorrow. He will be there, uh, Eric, uh, our buddy <laughs> yep. Eric. Right? Absolutely. Um, but you ran for the school board in the 1990s. Yep. And it was clear, it wasn't just a desire to, to you know, throw, to uh, accumulate power. And, and then throw your weight around, but you had kids and you wanted them to uh, have someone uh, representing them on the local uh, school board. And that was really, really an interesting experience. This was in the Bronx, right? The Soundview section. It was section. in the Bronx, Soundview section of the Bronx. Have you thought of doing that again? Because it would seem that there would be so many people who would benefit, not, not specifically that, um, but running for political office. You know, the interesting thing, as I wrote the book, more and more people, are, people, some people have said it before I wrote the book, after writing the book, many people are suggesting it. But no, I don't think I'll do that. I'd rather come to events like this and support the elected officials and helping really do what's interesting to me from a diversity standpoint, make sure we create opportunities for people of color and women to really uh, move up within the society in which we live and try to equal the playing field. So personally, no, uh, but I would say, yes, I've been hearing a lot of voices about people trying to encourage me to do something like that. Well, let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, and here we are at 730. Marsha had said that um, we should be, um, you know, calling it uh, an evening at uh, at 730. Um, and it went by so quickly. Um, it did. You know, Bruce and... Um, Thank you, and the world will, um, world around us will thank you uh, also as it spreads. <laughs> right. it... Yes, and I, I want to thank you too. Um, uh, it's um, thank you for telling your story. It needs to be heard. I um, I read the book, and I want to say to you, Ron, thank you for your close reading of the book. Of your amazing listening, 
thoughtful questions about the book. Um, it really is an important example, a model, um, and I hope that many, many people read it um, because uh, we all get a lot out of other people's authentic, honest stories. So um, thank you both so much for being a part of this. It's really been an honor to host you. Uh, and thank all of you for being here tonight. And I hope everybody has um, a really good rest of your evening. And thank you, Marsha thank you. and Ron. Greatly appreciate it. All the best. Much success. Thank you.